Nonsta, Chryso, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Welsh Asian Heritage Project's first monthly seminar on the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan, paving the way for a more racially inclusive society by 2030. Our monthly seminars provide a platform for wider debate around equality, migration, resilience, identity, culture, and heritage. My name is Paminda Dillon, and I am the project leader for the Welsh Asian Heritage Project at the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales. The Welsh Asian Heritage Project is a community engagement project that celebrates and archives the experiences of Ugandan Asians in Wales, especially those who came to the camp in Tonwenai, North Wales, after being expelled in 1972. We are also recording important places of cultural, religious, and historical significance to Welsh Asian communities. As no community is an island in itself, the Ugandan Asian stories are also the stories of the many Asian communities of Wales. The Welsh Asian Heritage Project is funded by the Anti-Racist Wales Culture, Heritage and Sport Fund, which is part of the Anti-Racist Wales Programme of the Welsh Government's Race Equality Action Plan, the plan that we will hear more about today. This groundbreaking initiative drives a vision of an anti-racist Wales by 2030 by tackling systemic and institutionalized racism to promote active citizenship and equitable services across all sectors. And it is aimed at making meaningful and measurable changes to the lives of black, Asian and minority ethnic people. Our first speaker will talk about the journey that led to the plan being launched in 2022. Before I introduce our speakers for this evening, uh, a couple of organizational points. You're welcome to ask questions after each talk, as well as at the end. Please write your questions in the question and answer function and not in chat. We will be using chat to post additional information for you. This evening's talk is being recorded and will be shared on other platforms. For those not watching this live, you're welcome to send us any questions and to share your comments. We will reply to them as soon as we can. Now to the topic for this evening, the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan, paving the way for a more racially inclusive society by 2030. I have great pleasure in welcoming two keynote speakers, Usha Ladwa Thomas and Nashima Begum, both powerful equality leaders and those who have been commended nationally as well as locally for their work on race equality. I have apologies from Rajvi Glassbrook, who is unfortunately not able to join us today. I hope Rajiv will join us at a future session. So can I start by introducing our first speaker, Usha Ladwa Thomas. Usha will speak about the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan, outlining the journey of how the plan developed and the principles underpinning it. Usha is a race advisor and works for Cardiff University. She has her roots in social and community work and has a deep commitment to social justice, equalities, and co-production as a way of relating to citizens. As a civil servant, Usha developed the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan and now is engaged in reflective learning about the plan from her base as a distinguished visiting fellow at Cardiff University. Usha delivers leadership, training and development, both in the UK and internationally. She has extensive experience of working with diverse communities in Welsh government, she also helped set up Academy Wales, worked on climate change and environment, and developed models of place-based work. Welcome. Over to you, Usha. 
Thank you very much, Paminda. And Nostar, it's really, really good to be able to talk to a whole lot of community people rather than uh, what my day job is normally, talking to academics or civil servants. So I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I, I hope it'll go smoothly because we've done a trial run, but you, you never know. Wait, well, I think we've done it. <laughs> so um, let me start at the beginning. And I, I think um, um, Perminda asked me to talk about sharing the journey. And I think it's quite a good place to start in terms of understanding, uh, if you like, how we at a nation level think about what racism is and what anti-racism is and what we try to do. And if you don't mind me saying, we're probably the only nation, the small nation, that's actually got an anti-racist Wales action plan. Uh, there are not many uh, countrywide ones. And actually, we tried to develop it at a time when things were quite hard in terms of the UK government that didn't really believe in racism existing. So um, my challenge now is to go through with you what we did. Um, before I start, just to say that there's something about language and across Wales um, and across <laughs> countries, uh, there's a continuing dialogue about what we call people. And in part of our journey, we struggled with trying to get the right balance. Um, we were lots of people who said to us, we do not want to be called BAME, uh, short for Black, Asian and ethnic minority people, and uh, particularly young people who felt that it didn't describe them. So collectively, we agreed, and you might have different views about it, but you know, for a, a, a nationwide sort of document, we need to have a collective agreement, and we're using Black, Asian, minority, ethnic. Sometimes because of my own political beliefs and things like I slip into black as a short term or ethnic minorities, but just to explain that. So I'm going to go next slide. OK, so where were we? Um, it, you'll all recall uh, pre-COVID that uh, there was quite a lot of sort of uh, effort to try and do something around racism. I mean, racism's been around for so many years and I worked in this area for about 40 years. So it's not a new initiative, as it were. Government had tried to do other things before. But it all got a bit derailed by COVID and 19 emergency. But actually, every um, tragedy has an opportunity, doesn't it? So I think part of the opportunity that COVID did was to raise the um, disproportionate numbers of Black and Asian minority ethnic people dying of COVID, whether they were care workers or they were patients. And highlighted that, you know, we have a systemic problem in terms of how we're trying to um, tackle racism. So in uh, the year after, in, in um, uh, 2020, oh, my screen's not quite right, so I can't see my, ah, we jump started in June 2020. So the minister, Jane, had asked us to develop something. And it also coincided with the time that George Floyd was murdered. And the whole conversation, even in our corridors, was starting to be about, oh, what is racism? And what do we mean about white privilege? What do we mean about being woke? All those sorts of things, which previously we weren't really doing that much with. So it was an opportunity. Um, I, I think um, one of our challenges was that it, we're working with communities where a lot of things hadn't really worked before. So part of our new mantra was, well, we have to do something different, whether it's communicating what we're trying to do or whether we're going to be listening or whether we're going to be doing any strategies. So we basically use the metaphor of a train, and I'm going to use that again, because it explains the journey better than I can do in other words. So where were we? Well, we actually stopped the train in 2020 and said, come on, just let's listen what people want before we start making assumptions that people want a strategy or they want, you know, regional plans or whatever. Um, and uh, the main messages we heard was that people wanted us to listen to their lived experiences. There was a cynicism that, you know, policy never really understood what it felt like to experience racism in service provision, in workforce, etc. And they didn't really want a strategy because um, I, I joined their <laughs> cynicism. They felt that um, uh, strategies always sat, sat on Welsh government um, shelves, collected dust and could never got delivered. So they wanted a very detailed plan. Um, and they also said, you know, the main thing is that you can spend a lot of time doing a plan, but then it can drop into a hole. Uh, we, we call it the implementation gap. And finally, can you please do it with us and don't do it to us? And do it in our words so we understand what you're doing. So these were the sorts of things we tried to keep in mind as we went along. 
the need for a map for the journey was really urgent because uh, you know we needed to know where we were starting, which was by listening. Uh, we wanted to be able to be really clear about who was giving the permissions and steering the train and deciding what junctions we take, what routes we take, how quickly the train's going, but also why why are we going and where are we going and how will we get there and what when what needs to happen when we arrive. Um, those are sort of simple, if you like, strategy questions, but actually they're not always uh, articulated in that way as a journey. So people often think it's all uh, strategy language. Um, for me, uh, the biggest important thing and was who was driving the train and who was going to keep a uh, foot on the accelerator. Um, those of you who know uh, the cabinet will know that the first minister is an absolute buyer into co-production. It's also my background and that of the team that I worked with, uh, Ayana and Nashima and others uh, that were that gathered together to produce this, this piece of work. And so having that permission to do something in a co-production where it was brilliant. We had Jane Hutt and supported by Uzo Awobi, who was um, the minister's specialist advisor on race. Um, both were really keen to make this happen and happen fast. And so having that expectation from the minister to say, I can't wait for this. I want a draft tomorrow. I want it done soon was really, really helpful. We also had a steering group where we had uh, Professor Bono, who was the external um, chair for this work, piece of work. But we also managed to persuade the, the minister and the permanent secretary, Andrew Goodall, that they needed to co-chair this work because having that leadership right at the top, which was visible and articulate, really made the difference to this uh, journey. Um, so why go where and how and, you know, what needs to be there when we get there? Um, I, I, Paminda mentioned that I do international leadership work. I use a model where we talk about the journey of uh, the strategy or a plan. And we always say that, OK, so we're starting, you know, on the left hand corner where we're all there sitting in our own places and the visuals are very international. So that's why they are what they are. We're going to launch off a board and we're looking to go to a sort of sunny future. and really we need to identify what that sunny future looks like and what sort of time scale we're talking. Usually when we talk about uh, strategies or plan, we talk about sort of 10 years or that sort of time scale. But really, it's not really practical because there's so much change in between. So what we said is, what about two years? Let's just see how we do in two years time. Let's not do another strategy then, but refresh it from what we've learned from. And the community seemed very keen on doing that. So we use that visual to have some consultation, um, well, some discussions with uh, groups of people that East uh, convened for us. So there were elders, there were young people, there were community members, there were organizations. I think uh, I probably remember doing about eight of those sessions. And, you know, it was all done on online, which meant that it was more inclusive than normally where we'd have to get to places and people would have to come on a rainy night. Um, so, um, so why? Why are we doing this? Um, and I think in, in their own words, it was about making a significant change to the lives of the people that we wanted to try and serve. And in the consultation, they actually added collectively. They said, this isn't something just government can do. This is what all public services, private industry, et cetera, need to do and community to help, which I felt really good about because I thought, yeah, we're all taking joint responsibility. And the vision, so what is the sort of sunny future? And this one also often comes up because people say, you know, anti-racist words by 2030, is it gonna be possible? We know it's not, <laughs> but you have to have a, a vision of which way you're going. And of course it won't arrive, but if we made some measurable changes to people's lives, then that would be really significant. And values, so, you know, how are we gonna walk this thing? There are gonna be lots of sharks and there are gonna be lots of, um, you know, um, barriers on the way, there's gonna be, ill winds, there are going to be challenges like, you know, cost of living, all that sort of thing. How are we going to work together? And people were clear that they wanted it to be right-based, that it was about lived experiences, and it was about transparency and openness. Again, in the discussion, I can tell you more, but just whizzing through it now. So to carry on the an analogy of the train, um, those of you who work with the Welsh government uh, will probably know that we work in our silos or policies where they it's about health and social care or education or transport or whatever. And those of you who don't know how Welsh government works, you know, think about the different carriages, the different silos. And those are the different policy areas that we work in. 
quite often one of our major challenges that we don't necessarily work together in a joined up way. So one of our challenges was how do we do something that has a sort of a baseline and a way that everybody contributes and it's not just some department contributing and it's not all just about uh, employment because that was quite a big one at that time um, and so we collected uh, 14 carriages 14 uh, policy areas and they're listed in the final detailed plan and each of them has an action plan we wanted that to happen not just by the civil servants sitting in those carriages you know door shut getting on with it and writing what they thought was needed but to do it with ethnic minority people we used several approaches. One was about community mentors, and uh, and Ashima was key to this. And it was her idea that um, we always go and do co-production by asking somebody else to do it for us, and then we wait for a report, and then we ignore it. And she said, well, why don't we just bring co-production into the office? So we had a number, and I always forget the number, <laughs> of uh, uh, community uh, mentors who came and joined different policy leads and helped them to bring the lived experience. They weren't experts on race disparity or anything like that, but they brought their understanding of what practice looks like, what at the other end of delivery looks like. And I think that was really useful to um, the policy leads because they don't normally always have these conversations. Um, oh, how did that happen? So um, the other thing we uh, did, uh, so oh, sorry, I'll just go back to that. Um, we also use other methods. We did some deep dives. And some of you might have joined them. So what we did was to invite the policy leads to come and listen to the people who lived experience mattered in that area. So we had quite a lot of people who came and talked about, um, you know, what it felt like to be out and about in the daytime and being stopped and searched. And what happened if you're a Gypsy Roma traveler community and how were you treated when the police came and shipped you along to young black people who were constantly stopped and searched to women who had been experiencing really poor outcomes in health uh, in the maternity services. So we had all these different people in different policy areas telling us what it was like. <clears throat> we also had the Wales Centre for Public Policy that brought uh, desk research to us. And traditionally, the way we do policy is that we ask um, uh, academics quite often to give us uh, sort of, you know, what's the research? Tell us what do you recommend? And we thought, no, actually, this time what seems to be missing is that we're not getting the policy leads to really understand that it isn't about just taking that recommendation, but it's actually listening to the lived experience to make it more um, relevant to what people are looking for. So the deep dives were very, very effective. I uh, can't remember how many did, but we must have done at least 10. And they were fantastic because our uh, manager, Claire Bennett, again, those of you attended will probably know those, was amazing at uh, facilitating and holding the space. And I think we learned a lot about how you hold space for people who bring their lived experiences, because it's not about challenging, questioning or sorting it. It's about listening. And she was very tough in terms of saying, you are not to challenge, you're not to do, you just got to listen. And it touched a lot of people. And one of the sort of uh, distractions I'm going to go into is that Quite often, people came out of it, the policy leads, who were sort of quite upset or, you know, emailed me afterwards and said, God, I, you know, I find it so distressing, listen to it, all that sort of thing. And I was having a discussion with Jane Hutt, and Jane Hutt said, so, you know, what, what, is, what is that about? And I said, well, I don't feel like that, and I don't know why, because I feel like I'm, maybe I'm hardened to it. And then in discussion with her, I said, do you know what it is, Minister? I said, you know, I worked in this area 20 years ago, and I heard the same stories. The thing is, nothing has changed. I could literally repeat the stories they were telling me 20 years ago to what was happening now. And so it wasn't that I was immune to it. Where I found it difficult is when organizations and policy officials said, oh, we can't do that. We haven't got the budget. Um, it's not enough a remit. We haven't got the powers. That's where I got triggered and upset. So it, those of you who might be listening who, you know, would like to talk about their lived experience and when they get triggered, that's quite an interesting one for me. We were also keen that we established a very strong governance framework because uh, we felt that in terms of implementation, if you don't actually do what we need to do in terms of getting the voices of uh, ethnic minority people on the table, then we're going to get back into consultation. We're going to get back into tokenistic, you know, bring three black people onto the table, you know, just give them the papers um, and then say, well, we, we, we involve people. So we worked quite hard to think how we can have a different model. And so we set up an external accountability group, which is shared with uh, Professor 
Professor Bono and the Permanent Secretary. And we openly recruited seven independent race experts in seven policy areas. And the idea of the experts was that, you know, once you can have lived experience, like I've got it in some areas, I can't really tell you about the disparities in numbers and, and in terms of policy solutions and things, unless I restudied it. So the idea was that we needed some experts and they have come from the UK. We opened it up. We said, this is about anybody who can help us to bring that knowledge. Um, we also recruited 11 community representatives with lived experience. And this group at the moment uh, forms external accountability group. The race advisors and the community reps also take part in subgroups for the policy groups because it's quite hard to manage a large group of people in these events and to get meaningful outcomes. Internally, we've got a, um, you know internal support and challenge group. Uh, we're supported by a race disparity unit. Happy to talk about them in a minute if you wanted. And we just now advertised and are recruiting uh, managers for the race for us. So there are four regional forums that we are um, going to be setting up. And that was because we recognized that, you know, we don't always cover all of ways in terms of, you know, having the dialogue and we needed people on the ground. Um, and we've got people like Praminda and Jyoti and others, but actually they quite often do it in their own times and they're quite often knocking on our doors rather than we knocking on their doors. So that's again, to change the, the balance in terms of we need to be there. So we published the documents and the easy read, uh, which is the introduction, is worth looking at if you haven't, because that explains a lot of the language we've used, what anti-racism is, uh, how we did it, um, what were the sort of themes and challenges for policy officials, and the detailed one, which we actually wrote first. Um, when we sat and looked at it, my boss and myself, we said, oh my God, how are we going to say that this is in, in their words and uh, accessible? And so we, we wrote the introduction because we felt that it was really important that people felt that they could understand but we also needed the policy um, officials to have deadlines and op, um, impact and all those things that you need to hold people to account. Uh, before I just say my thank you, I know Perminder uh, that uh, Raju is not here. So I, I just wanted to say that in terms of implementation, I mean, we're nearly approaching sort of year and a half and people often say, so what difference have you made? And it's really quite challenging in terms of trying to make change at a very high level. So one of the things that we were constantly hitting against was that, you know, in terms of measuring change, we, we needed data. What can we do? What's the baseline? So, you know, a lot, a lot of the race disparity unit are working on that. We've got um, people who are supporting us in the NHS around looking at whatever our workforce data is. Again, you know, till we know what the baseline is and what the experience is in a quantifiable way, in a qualitative way, we, we learned a lot from the lived experience. And for Wales, what can we do and how do we tackle it has been an issue. Um, I mean, Nashima is going to talk about her work. And so Nashima from the team of the, the people who are developing the plan moved to work with the um, culture, heritage and sports. And so she's a real example of somebody who took it through to implementation. And I won't take thunder away from her. But across the board, we've been thinking about, you know, how do we give grants? How do they get to people of ethnic minority peoples? Listening constantly to what had been the barriers, how had they been? A lot of third sector organizations, for instance, told us that they felt all monitored. So we're looking at, you know, do we need to have this all monitoring going on just to get the better feedback we need. And feedback as well, you know, do we need to do a huge impact or we do basically go and ask people like Paminda and say, was it any good? Did it work for you? So um, lots of times for questions. So uh, Paminda, I'll stop there if that's okay. Great, thank you so much, Usha. That was such a great, um, simple uh, <laughs> journey of a very complex and complicated policy area. And having been involved in community consultation and the deep dive sessions, so I really appreciate the amount of work that went in. I think we can take some questions now. So can I please introduce David Thomas, the Head of Public Services of the Royal Commission, to take us to any Q&A questions that might I have existed? 
I, um, we, don't, we don't have any, any in there yet. I think if people can say, save up their questions, we'll have another opportunity to ask some questions at the end as well. So I think if we run that as a session for questions for both uh, Usha and Nishima, uh, I think that's, that's that's probably best. But yeah, but feel feel free to, to, to ask any questions in the question and answer um, uh, facility on Zoom. People have been listening, that's why, David. I, I think that must be it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do I have a question. question. <laughs> I, I do have a question somebody sent in advance, but we can take that in the quick Q&A. So great. thank you very much, Usha. Can I now come to our second speaker, uh, to Nashima Begum? Uh, Nashima is our second speaker. Um, and as um, I said earlier, she will speak about how, um, uh, really about implementing, delivering on the culture, heritage and sport goals and actions. Um, her title is Our Approach to Implementation. Nashima is a senior policy advisor on race equality in Welsh government's culture division and, su and supports the implementation, I think, of 22 projects that includes the Welsh Asian Heritage Project, our project. Nashima is a policy professional with many years of experience in policy development and implementation on race equality. As um, Usha has already said, she was part of the team that developed the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan and now leads on the implementation. And Nashima is our link person uh, in regard to the Welsh Asian heritage. Welcome, Nashima. Over to you. Thank you so much, Paminda, and um, lovely to be with everyone this evening. Um, David, are you happy to share my presentation? Wonderful, thank you. So, Really, I think this is a lovely segue from Usha's um, presentation of how did we go on that journey and, you know, the, the sort of the launch of the plan and the, the journey of, of next, where next, so it's that sort of implementation stage. Can I um, go to the next slide, David? Yeah. So as um, Paminda said, I have the lead responsibility for um, overseeing the delivery of the um, goals and actions that reside within the culture, heritage and sports section of the ARWA, the anti Resource Action Plan. And um, it's, it's an ambitious plan altogether, but also in our section, we've set some challenging, uh, and rightly so, some challenging sort of sets of actions and deliverables. So within that, we have five goals and 19 actions. And those are sort of um, uh, organised in, in, a, in, a, in a way that, we, we where we think that we need to make the greatest change so the sort of themes are sort of underlying leadership funding celebrating diversity the historic narrative and learning about cultural diversity because these are the themes that we often heard from those deep dive sessions from those community engagement that within the culture heritage and sports sectors we need to focus on those so that's where we've given our focus within the plan next slide david so what does delivery look like for us? Um, Usha mentioned, obviously, that Welsh Government, we have a number of levers and we need to sort of use those levers to make those change. So culture, in some ways, they were sort of kind of behind the game in terms of coming on board, in terms of the development of the plan. And it's not at all culture, heritage or sports fault. But actually, one of the things that happened was when the rapid evidence review um, was was underway, and you know they, the recommendations were made. What well, were all the priorities? Actually, the, our area was not seen as a priority, but well, well, certainly wasn't identified as a priority. And it was only through the um, engagement and the conversation with Black, Asian, and minority ethnic people that they said, "Hold on a second, you've missed a critical part of this area, and we really want to listen to them." They said, "Well, hold on a second you know, women, young girls can't actually access and participate fully in, in sports because there are so many barriers. Your your cultural sector is not inclusive. It's not representative of the diversity of Wales. You know, your health sector, you know, particularly with everything that was going on and bringing it to the fore in terms of death of George Floyd and the, the BLM movement, particularly the narrative that's you know, that was there, you know, it was unrepresentative and it didn't tell a true story in terms of slavery, colonialism, imperialism. So, you know, we came on board and really took a, a real sort of, um, you know, drive in getting, getting this done. And that drive really within the team that I work for has continued. And I think, and, and 
it was really nice that I actually worked on a plan and came on, on board with this because they started that work and they started to do some of the preliminary implementation prior to the launch. So in terms of our mechanism, that whole system approach, so how do we make a difference within our sector? So we, we sort of almost decided that we'll just launch in and that what does that launch in look like? So it's about enabling our um, arms length bodies. So, you know, the Royal Commission, the Arts Councils, the National Museum, National Library, Sports Wells, you know, you guys in terms of saying, well, yes, you have a duty under the, you know, um, uh, Equality Act to do, you know, to deliver on equality, including race, but actually we'll give you a bit more money to really accelerate work because we need to try and achieve this ambition of um, an anti-racist, you know, world by 2030. But also recognizing that, you know, our, you know, local sector organizations also need a support and, you know, capacity building. So we actually funded our local sector. So it's those local sector that Paminda just mentioned, the 22 organizations. So all together actually have my arms length bodies and the 22 organizations together that I oversee. And those local sector organizations comprise of your um, museums, your sports organizations, your heritage organizations, um, a really wide array. Some are very new to the to, to the space of, um, you know, uh, equality and anti-racism. Others are um, much more advanced and I'll talk about some of them a bit later. So the other element was actually, yes, so we've got our arms length bodies that we funded, we've got a local sector that we funded, but also recognizing and one of the things that within the action plan was, and we heard as well from our, you know, um, ethnic minority um, communities and individuals, your funding structure doesn't meet our needs. Your funding structure is inaccessible. So one of the things that we decided to do is how do we build capacity and capability within our local sector, particularly the Black, Asian and minority ethnic led organisation. So one of the funding um, schemes that I've just recently launched, which is being managed by Diverse Cymru, is our culture community engagement, um, sorry, beg your pardon, culture grant, um, grant grassroots grant organisation, sorry, too late in the day. Um, and through that is about really enabling out those organizations to receive funding in order for them to create their own interpretation of what culture looks like, create that and participate in that, um, you know, uh, activity um, with their stakeholders. And, you know, really pleased that we funded 26 organizations this fun um, financial year, some multi-year funding, and in the process of relaunching this uh, grant scheme next year. So there's three different components and it's about that sort of top down bottom up approach that we've taken through our sort of funding uh, lever. Also within obviously the, um, the remit letters that goes out to uh, our arms length bodies, there's a very clear stipulation for those organizations to be delivering on the anti-resource action plan. So that's basically the whole of whatever the actions are in the, in the plan for us. So, the other thing I want to talk about is co-production and uh, Usha talked a lot about co-production in her presentation. So really the value of co-production was something that we recognised and we wanted to build into our um, funding um, structure. So every single um, funding that we've given for, to our national and local sector in particular, we've said, right, one of the key criteria for you is when you're developing your programme of work, you have to co-produce with Black, Asian and minority ethnic people and actively be working with them. And I talked a little bit about building capacity and capability. So that particular element of it, for me, is very much about building the capacity and capability of our uh, grassroots organizations, but recognizing that there's elements of building capacity and capability amongst our local you know, sector organizations, but particularly the grassroots organizations that have said your funding structure is inaccessible. So what I've tried to do is actually create um, you know, uh, sort of avenues that will enable them to build their capacity and capability in terms of actually how they access funding. So making sure that I review the funding structure for our culture division, make that much more simpler, make it much more accessible and really work with those organizations and what I needed to do differently. Dave, you can have the next slide, please. So in terms of culture, heritage and sport, I talked briefly about our sort of, um, you know, approach to it, but actually just a little bit more deeper down of what that looked like. So 
recognizing internally that culture division is not very diverse, um, that actually, you know, lived experience, particularly, you know, people lived experience needed to um, inform our decision making, inform how we need to implement. So actually, I appointed four community mentors um, into, um, into the space. Uh, to support and advise me and hold me to account in terms of how I do things. And because I recognize that actually as, as a black Asian minority ethnic individual, we're not a homogenous you know, set of people. We have our own experiences, our own, you know, in terms of racism, and that we all have different ways of thinking. So actually again, that varied view is really, really important. So I talked about funding. So what what does that funding pot look like? So I have a relatively healthy budget of five million, but it's not when you split over the three years, it's not very much actually. So it's committed over 22 to 25 financial year to support our national, regional, local and grass organizations, as I mentioned previously. So of that, what have we given to our arms length bodies? Well, we've given them 1.8 million pounds over the three year um, period. And as I said, that's really to accelerate their work, recognizing that this isn't something that, that you do and you forget, but actually you, be, you should be doing actively. And this is really to push you along a bit more. And then of that 5 million as well, we gave 2.8 million to our local, um, regional and national organizations, uh, the 22 organizations I, I mentioned. And then of the 5 million, um, I've committed to 455,000 pounds for this year and next year to support our grassroots engagement and participation. And at the moment, one of the things that colleagues um, here today will know and others certainly will know is for me, it's about what happens next. So how do we make sure that once this funding finishes, how do we build on legacy? So internally, one of the things I'm exploring is, uh, is a sort of a, a digital learning hub. So how do I support those sectors that have been really engaged, as well as those that haven't quite engaged yet, in, in developing their understanding of what anti-racism looks like and how do you put that into practice within their own organization. So this is a bit of a, it's, it's a, at a very early stage of development, but I've had discussions and been collaborating with, with colleagues like um, the Royal Commission to understand what the needs are. Next slide, please, Robert. Sorry, David. Okay. So in terms of our approach and the progress, so really, really briefly, and I won't elaborate too much because it's on screen and apologies, it's, it's a lot of words, um, but it's, it's very varied and, and there's lots happening. So in terms of just looking at, um, you know, I'm going to the Cymru, the National Museum, you know, they started to sort of do a matrix of their trustees and assessment and develop appropriate sort of training and development for their um, trustees. Because obviously, you know, in order to make change and tangible change, and you know, and and that, uh, on anti-racism, you need to make sure your board and those at the top, you know, are sort of driving that change. In terms of the National Library, um, you know, work has begun on their Dictionary of Welsh Biography to make it much more uh, inclusive, and and there are contributions from ethnic minority people, and also they begun work uh, leading on the Communities of Wales project and is helping school children around Wales to understand and embrace uh, and celebrate diversity and recognize actually some schools aren't diverse, but how do we bring that diversity into that school? So they have a really good understanding of, of the, you know, in the, the Welsh community as a whole that they live in, but also the global sort of um, community that they, they reside in. Next slide, please, David. Thank you. Um, Sport Wales. So one of, the, one of their key sort of targets is around training. So their focus is training and they are looking at training at board and sort of executive level and then filtering down. And, and they've been doing various different sort of um, leading on different initiatives um, to make their spaces inclusive and doing a sort of a reflective work on what, that, what does that inclusive um, space look like and how do we incorporate it into other areas of work. And obviously, um, yourselves are all commission, you know, a fantastic piece of work that's being led by Paminda, uh, Chris and the team and others as well. So I won't, I won't delve too much into that because obviously you'll be familiar with that. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. So in terms of just broader sort of work, um, I, I sort of mentioned a few things, so I won't, I won't 
sort of um, elaborate too much, but in terms of our CADU colleagues, one of the things that they've been working on and is, is due for publication very soon is the public commemoration and, and Wells guidance. So one of the big pieces of work that happened, um, I think it was alongside the development of the ARWAP, was sort of review and audit of our, the places that we commemorate, the significance of uh, names, of street names, etc. And then as a result of that, a series of recommendations were made and, and now this particular guidance that's going to um, local authorities in order for them to review their sort of, um, you know, public spaces, places, etc. Um, I talked briefly about the 26 organisations we funded and, and the next round, and then I also talked about the Digital Learning Hub. So one of the other pieces of work that I'm, I'm working on at the moment with colleagues, um, sorry, apologies for the acronym, so CAS is the Knowledge and Analytical Services team internally within Welsh Government. So we've given funding, so what impact is it make, you know, is it having an a, you know, oh, have we done it right? So uh, there's a piece of evaluation that I'm, I'm working on with colleagues internally to actually evaluate all the schemes and actually see what difference has it made and what do we need to do differently if we were to award grant funding again. So, you know, at some point, um, you know, colleagues will be in touch with um, my um, CAS colleagues and, and the conversation around that will sort of be much more um, enriched on that. Next slide, please, David. So I talked a bit about the 22 organisations that we funded that I referred to them as the local sector, but obviously it's, it's local, regional and independent organisations. So, you know, th there are 22. Uh, so I, I won't have time to talk about all 22, but I thought I'd pick up some of them um, and the work they're doing. So um, Show Race of the Red Card have been funded and they've done a piece of work because obviously, you know, not very long ago, Welsh Rugby Union were sort of, you know, making headlines for not very good reasons. Um, so they then approached um, Show Race of the Red Card and through our funded um, sort of project, they came on board and embarked on a journey towards becoming much more inclusive and making their organization much more anti-racist. So that's a piece of work that, that's happened and, and lots of other sort of subsequently, lots of policies are being developed by Welsh Rugby Union. The other project that we fund is Women Connect First and a project called Sport for Wales. And this is where I think, where we talk about intersectionality. So, you know, it's about racism, but I've got women who are faced with, you know, exclusion because of their cultural or faith needs. So we heard obviously that, you know, sport wasn't accessible. So this particular funding was about how do we make sports accessible for women? And Women Connect First, the numbers are staggering. I think this is kind of outdated, but you know, 190 women and young girls from a diverse range of backgrounds coming in and participating in fitness, sport, and other health and well-being activities. And I think this is a testament to actually the need to have sports really diversified and inclusive because the take-up is so high when it's delivered appropriately. Next slide, please, David. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Sorry, I realised I um, as I went through my presentation, it was quite flat. There were no uh, real images, so here comes the images. So one of the, the projects that um, we funded is uh, the reverse mentoring programme, and I believe that um, Royal Commission is being reverse mentored, which is fantastic. So we pay uh, awarded grant funding to Race Council Cymru to deliver a re reverse mentoring programme, and what that programme does is, is provide individuals with lived experience to work with senior executives within the culture and arts and creative sector and actually go through um, their policies and talk through with them about how they can make real tangible changes to become anti-racist and embed anti-racist practices within their policies. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please, David? Brilliant. Fantastic. Oh, so this is this is one of our um, uh, arm's length body um, collaborative um, piece of uh, work, a project. So um, 
Arts Council of Wales is working in partnership with um, the National Museum, Amgur for Cymru, and they have, uh, well, they've um, commissioned seven galleries and seven museums to work together collaboratively to bring, create spaces and exhibition spaces for Black, Asian, minority, like creative practitioners. Um, and this is a sort of ongoing project it's called the Perspective Project, um, which is, is going to be fantastic. And I, I really look forward to, to sort of um, seeing it when it, you know, is, is live. But the project, the seven galleries across Wales um, with various different sort of needs and, um, you know, Arts Council and National Museum working really closely in terms of how they make sure that their services are tailored to make sure those creative practitioners have the right skill not not the skills sorry that's the wrong word have the right um support um to engage in those sort of activities next slide please um again one of our local sector um grant schemes so this is um Kieran Cymru that we funded one of our heritage projects and it's looking at actually uh, and investigating um the how people of particularly South Asian backgrounds participated in World War II and the connection between Wales and um, you know South Asian people and, and the heritage there and is, is finding the stories that are lost in Wales um, from you know uh, servicemen and particular servicemen um, that they're trying to um, really recreate and, and capture in a, in a sort of a um, uh, a digital uh, uh, book. Next slide, please. Okay, this is one of our other projects. It's the, the Museum Collection Kenevan project. And this is a, a really lovely project making, you know, wonderful sort of progress. Um, uh, a wonderful um, person called Dr. Marion Gwyn leading on this project. So she's working with 10 local and independent museums who are undergoing review of their collections to identify objects and items that are associated with anti-slavery, colonialism, and diversity. And what's really wonderful about this project is that not only are they just reviewing it, but actually she's providing them with the training and support for them to continue that review and um, you know assessment process um, and the whole sort of support structure that is creating for those local and independent museums. Next slide, please. I think this is my final slide, hopefully. There might be just one more, so apologies, I've taken a bit longer than I, I anticipated. Um, really quickly, um, uh, one of our sport ones again, Dragon on My Shirt. Um, please just type into Google and, and go to Dragon on My Shirt and watch the uh, the the, um, the the videos of this. So there are I think three series created, and it tells the stories of um, really renowned um, and famous sort of footballers over the last 100 years uh, about the sort of uh, racism that they faced whilst they were in the profession and how they overcame it and 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 sort of the resilience that they had. Um, I think it's on various different platforms, but if you do type into Google, you should find it. Next slide, please. Thank you. Just really briefly then, the, I talked about the culture grant scheme. So just to give you a flavor of um, the types of projects we've funded, and they are sort of at the sort of early stages of their sort of um, in the initiation. So um, some of the, the amazing sort of projects include, um, you know, introducing young people to filmmaking and animation. We've got, um, you know, uh, a Roma, um, Roma Gypsy Traveller project looking at sort of cultural celebrations um, and how they include young people from the Roma Gypsy Traveller community to participate in, in sort of um, music and music um, creation that's unique to their culture. Um, there's a project which is to do with the Gurumitsia people in terms of collecting, preserving and promoting the arts and culture of those individuals. Um, there's a project around Somali creative practices that's specifically young people. And also we've got projects um, for asylum seekers and refugees. And I think um, the, the grassroots organization project, what it seeks to do is really create that sort of intersectional focus and it gives a bit of an intersectional focus on the work that we do because recognizing that some of that didn't quite come out as strongly in our other areas that I talked about. So this has been really a, a real focus. Um, there are 26 um, grant funded organization and and at some point hopefully 
I, I'd love to come and, and talk to you about those stories and share with you. Um, I think I think that's the sort of end of my um, presentation, but really have, yeah, oh, one more. <laughs> so what's next? So yeah, I, th I think, sorry, I'm, I'm ever so sorry. Um, I promise I think this is the last one. So I think what's next? So working with our sector. So I, I talked briefly about sort of um, creating additional learning hub about capturing a good practice. But for some of the conversation that I've been having with colleagues, um, you know, at monitoring meetings about, well, actually, what does legacy look like for you? How, how are you capturing good practice? Because one of the things that uh, I'm very mindful of is that, you know, when we give grant funding, that it shouldn't be that you've done that particular project book close end of but actually what have you learned and what um, good learning are you going to take from that in terms of embedding it within your organization so at the moment there's lots of conversations happening around that um, and, and also support structures that I put in place for those organizations but for them to also think about what they do in terms of actually that legacy building around anti-racism thank you Goodness, uh, Nishima, thank you so much for packing so much information in that short uh, time that you gave the presentation. Really commendable and commendable is all the, even the new strand of work that you, that's been the funding of grassroots uh, organizations. And um, you mentioned the Grametius project that's going to be launched tomorrow and we have been in touch with that project. So there's a lot of heritage work going on, extremely exciting, great uh, opportunity for us to collaborate and work together. So thank you. I think David, um, we can see if there are any uh, questions and answers. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we still don't have any questions. Uh, I'm sorry, but, um, um, but, uh, but you said you had a question that you'd had previously about, about this. Yes, um, somebody uh, called Manpreet from Cardiff, who couldn't be here today, um, sent this question in. I, um, he said, the Race Equality Action Plan is highly commendable, and there is a lot of action on the ground. How can ordinary people feed their experiences back to those who are monitoring the progress of the action plan? Should I have a go? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, a really good question, really, because I think there is a gap, isn't it? Because uh, whilst we have lots of sort of grassroots organisations, things like that, how we collate, collate them together to give that feedback upwards. So a lot of this can feel like a lot of top down stuff happening to people and communities, but not enough in terms of what's coming from the bottom up as hard as we try. It's really hard at government level to do that. So th that's the reason for setting up the community fora that we are mentioned earlier. So there'd be four regional fora with four uh, managers who will be doing exactly that is helping you at grassroots to have a dialogue with us. Um, and that could be in all sorts of forms. So it could be because we're delivering a new policy and or it could be that, you know, we've messed up on something <laughs> and you want us to know about it. But it's also an opportunity for the policy leads to be able to talk to grassroots communities themselves. Um, I mean, if I tell you the number of times I get colleagues in Welsh government saying, can you give me a list of people from your community, I can contact them by consultation. And I said, I refuse to do it now. I said, no, that's not what we do. We go and talk to people and we actually make connections and relationships. So part of the thing that we found trying to this work is that the relationship building is as important as you know whatever the products are because trust in government was really poor at the beginning of this work. Um, and so part of it is that we want to increase that trust that people feel that they're heard. And, and, you know, I work in government, we don't get it right all the time. <laughs> and sometimes we do miss out people. And I think as, as a work developed, for for example, uh, the plight of Gypsy Roma travelers was still getting sidelined, you know. And so we're now focusing it more and saying, no, every time we do something, we've got to think about that and say, what does that mean? So I think that's one forum. But the other one is people like you, Praminda and Jyoti and, and David, you know, you are our channels of getting information to us and you already got relationships. So please use them and also use yourselves. You can always write in as well. Thank Great. you, Sha. Okay. Um, we have got one one uh, sort of comment actually now come up in the in the question answers from uh, Marion. Uh, it's a very nice comment. It says, uh, I'm, I'm so proud of Wales for leading on this work. Uh, it's unique in the UK uh, or indeed anywhere else. 
Uh, there are great individual examples happening elsewhere, but nothing that is government sponsored as it is in Wales. Uh, I know other countries are watching what we're doing, but what can the Welsh government do to shout out about this amazing work? Uh, it's so inspiring, a great model for others to follow. Thank you, Prof, because I think I joined Marion in her pride, because I think uh, Marion would be interested to know that I joined the Welsh government 20 years ago to try and do this sort of work. And somehow the ducks were just not in place. We didn't have the right leadership there saying we want it. We didn't have the right community pressure saying, let's do it. We didn't have the right dialogues happening in uh, everybody's households. you know. But, so things just came together at the right moment for us to be able to do that. And the fact, uh, you know, I, I have to celebrate that I work for ministers who actually did this work despite the UK government saying that there was no racism. They actually produced a report while we were doing this work saying racism doesn't exist, we don't have to worry about it. Um, and, you know, we took it back to our first minister and minister and they said, oh, well, they must be living in another planet, we're going to do it. So, you know, we had the permission and the drive from them to do it. But you also have to remember that this sort of work, you know, I, I get a bit embarrassed about awards and rewards, is not possible by any one or two people or just the leaders, you know, the five I displayed on this a slide. Um, the real work is done by people at grassroots, and Nishima will agree that, you know, people like Praminda and others who are just digging away daily and making it happen, we're just enablers in it. So government, I hope, um, I feel, and I feel proud that I think it's doing a good job in a, enabling, not in everything yet, but you know, we're getting there. But Nashima's examples were very good. I sat here feeling very proud of what she was saying. Nashima, do you want to add? Yeah, I, I think certainly I think there's lots of really good work happening across, um, you know, all the various different policy areas. And I think sometimes we probably don't, we're not, well, I, not we don't but I don't think we are in effective in the way in which we promote and I think it's about sharing those stories of what we've done and what we could do better and I think it's it's finding the strategies and it's it's always hard because I think there's so many different ways people like to be engaged and communicated and it's, it's really getting that balance right and I think I think something that you mentioned will be a, a real sort of avenue in, in driving that I think is that regional forum um, where you'll have a lot more grassroots you know sort of um engagement happening and it's using those mechanisms to share the stories but i think at that inter international level i think yes marion you're you're absolutely right that there are a lot of eyes watching and i think it's about you know organizations and individuals like yourself when you get that opportunity that you you share those stories and you share the success and, and uh, with them really we also had lots of interest from uh, the uk government but especially uh, from scotland and northern ireland and some European countries and America, the police for, uh, from one area of America came and wanted to know what we did. I was thinking, wow, <laughs> uh, you know, to have, to have a police officer from uh, America sitting at the desk with the front min first minister was quite a nice uh, story mm -hmm. to write about. So I, I think, yeah, we really need help you to tell the stories and we need you to help to write those stories because we, we are too far removed. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, that, that's it for the questions. There's no more, but uh, thanks very much for, for answering them. I'll just ask a question from both of you, really. Mm -hmm. uh, you work so hard in in developing and now implementing the Race Equality Action Plan. So come 2030, 2030, where do you think you would like the um, the Welsh society to be in? To go, Nishima, shall I? Um, I don't mind going. Um, I, I think, you know, like you said, Usha, isn't it? It's about having that vision. And I think vision always is, 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 is always good. It's, you know, I certainly, when I sort of um, talk to my, my son, I say, look, you need to set an ambition because if you don't have that ambition, you won't have that drive. So you need that. But I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm a realist and I realise that, you know, 2030 is a long way away. But actually, where I'd like to be is organisations that are much more representative and organisations that understand and what anti-racism looks like um, and how to embed that in their policy thinking and policy um, delivery stages. And I think that's, for me, that would be a real sort of um, achievement um, you know, I'm not going to say that every single member of Welsh, you know, society needs to be anti-racist. I don't think that's definitely going to happen. But organisationally, we need to change, and I think that's that's possible. 
Yeah, um, I guess for Minda, um, I mean, I probably won't be around in 2030 when the work is still happening. So I guess my um, vision is that when I'm sitting there being a sort of retired person and reading papers and doing flower arrangement or whatever I end up doing, <laughs> Uh, that the conversations around racism are much more every day, that people accept that racism happens, but we're still convincing people that racism happens, and that people start understanding how they're institutionalized, and also not just understand that they're institutionalized, but they're really good examples how what how we have changed things around. So, you know, by having Canavin and doing the education curriculum and things like that, they're real efforts at making change that no, nobody else is trying to do. A um, bit like Nishima, and when I set the vision with the community about, you know, 2030, we, we have this discussion every time, but you're not going to be there on 2030. And I said, no, but I would really like to see a lot of the disparities completely reduced. I mean, I'd be so happy if I just didn't have to turn the tally on and hear about stop and search and black young people being stopped disproportionately, you know. I'd be so happy if young kids who were saying to me that, you know, we learned about Gaynal Go in school, and we know who she is, we know who Charlotte uh, uh, Williams is, we know Nishima because, you know, she's been featured now in terms of the work she did. I think it's just like having those role models, and but for the mainstream society to be doing it, not just us as Black and Asian minority people. So I think having the mainstream community actually see this as not just a problem, but something we can solve, you know, so a solvable problem, I guess. That's at the top of my head. <laughs> Good question, though, I think about it. Maybe there's another comment or a question. Uh, yeah, there is. Um, somebody said, uh, I just really love to hear about these projects. Uh, food is something that really unites people. Um, is there any upcoming projects which have any foodie involvement? I'm really pleased to say several of our community, grassroots community organisations that have been funded are actually food related. So, yeah. Excellent, Excellent news. Not to talk about food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's getting to that time of the evening, isn't it? <laughs> no, I, I think it's a really interesting one, David, isn't it? I know we've got time, so I'm going to rant off a bit. But um, one of the things when we talked about anti-racism was, you know, so how does it differ from integration or from multiculturalism and things like that? And I always say to people that, you know, integration is all about whoever the minority is becoming more like the majority. And I come from a large family and six of my siblings have all changed their names so that people could pronounce them. And some of them even did it legally. I'm probably the only one and I don't know why, but I, it, I didn't think it was a need. Uh, it wasn't because I was into anti-racist work at that stage, it's just it just didn't happen. And then when you think about uh, things like multiculturalism, you know, we spent many years trying to do the sort of the sari samosas and um, the music uh, element of it. And we tried to say that, you know, if you appreciate our food and we can do samosa parties and some teacher how to wear saris and things like that. But if you look at it historically, it was quite biased towards, you know, us still trying to... Uh, mainstream and impress people. I think where we are now is that we've got much more of a balanced society, you know, look at our range of food on the high streets or wherever you are. I mean, mm -hmm. I used to be living in Cardiff, so the, there's one road called City Road, anybody who's listening in will know City Road, and we counted 116 different varieties of food you can get on that street, and that was unimaginable five years, mm -hmm. you know, or 20 years ago when I was living there. So mm -hmm. there's much more an acceptance, isn't it, of difference and mm -hmm. Uh, integration being both ways, not just one way. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Because yeah, I like talking, don't I, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very useful. That's very useful. Very interesting. <laughs> and, they, and it was a conscious decision that the action plan should be anti-racist rather than, yeah. you know, um, rather than multicultural mm -hmm. education type mm -hmm. stuff. So... Mm -hmm. Can I, can I say, uh, Usha and Nishima, it's been a real pleasure to listen to you. And, and I think you've given um, our audience lots to think about. That's why they're silent. They're just still processing the information. And don't be surprised if they come back to us, which yes. we will field on to you. Lots of questions and comments. Um, because I think that's... feedback is really welcome for Minda because you know, we don't always know on these online things how we come across. So it'd be really helpful. If they said, yeah. well, you could learn a lot of the language of uh, organizations, more about community or whatever, we welcome the feedback. 
I mean, there's a lot of information. There's lots to think about and lots to process. So I'm sure people will come back uh, with with their comments and and so on. Um, before uh, we conclude, um, and I asked David to conclude for us. Uh, can I just give you a diary reminder for our next seminar, which will be on the 21st of February. And um, the seminar will feature writers Amrit Wilson and Bharti Deer, who are uh, women writers who will speak on the theme of From Migration to Resilience. Very, very exciting um, seminar coming up, just like the exciting seminar we've had today. So thank you very, very much. I'd like to attend, please. Sorry? I'd like to attend that. Oh, brilliant. Please, you please book. <laughs> so, David, over to you. Okay, Joe. Jock Jock of Al Pominder, just the Igloy, Hoffman Jock and Val, Ricky Gid, Amamino, Anni Heno, East of a commission, Am Drevni. I can all of Jock and Val, Ricky, a Jock of Al Yawn, Ricky, Pominder, Nishima, and Usha, Am Excursia, Dizoro Yawn. Just to say, to, to, to finish with, uh, thank you all very much for joining us uh, with us uh, tonight um, and to the Commission staff who have been involved with the arrangements and, of course, to Paminda, uh, Nishima and Usha for your for your fascinating talks. Um, and please keep an eye out for further uh, lectures in this series. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Nostar. Nostar, thank you very much. Paul. Uh,